The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. Well, it still is the land of opportunity just as much as ever. In just a few minutes, in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Three Fathom Frame-Up. In a nation of more than 140 million people, a nation dedicated to the principles of free enterprise, where a man may earn his living as he chooses so long as he does not violate the law, it is not surprising that there is such a great variety of occupations. There are men who make their living by selling rare coins and stamps. Others will see to it that your home is not destroyed by termites. And still others will supply any service you happen to need from babysitting to flagpole sitting. Among those Americans who practice an unusual vocation is a small group of men who earn their daily bread by diving. They work in treacherous currents and under such conditions that a mistake by them or by someone on the surface can cost them their very life. They grow old before their time, these young veterans of this underwater profession... And there are hazards to their business that not even the most careful can foresee. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI introduces you to one of those men and tells you of one of the odd jobs he did. Tonight's file opens in a small shack located on the end of a pier which juts into the Pacific Ocean. It is early evening, and Paul Burnett and his wife are going over the ledger, which contains a record of his income for the past year. Paul? Hmm? Have you got the figures for July? Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Not very pretty, are they, Clara? Oh, they could be worse. Hmm. Salvage company called again today. Still offering the same job? Uh Uh-huh. They probably figure I've got to take their offer. But you don't have to, Paul. You've had some good jobs. Well, they weren't good enough. Paul, we saved for such a long time to buy your equipment. You've got to give it a chance. Well, we don't have to decide that tonight. I'll get it. Hello? Hello. Are you the diver? Yes. I'd like to hire you. Well, uh, who is this? My name is Green. Green? You don't know me. Are you acquainted with Timber Cove? Uh-huh. A member of our party dropped something off the dock there. Oh, what was it? I'd rather not talk about it on the phone. Well, there's only about 15 or 20 feet of water off that dock. Someone could put on a gas mask and die for you. At night? Well, no. I'd like to get the job done immediately. Can you come right out? Well, I'd rather not. There's a storm heading in off the ocean. What's your usual fee for a dive like this? A hundred dollars. I'm prepared to go as high as 500 Well... $500 is a pretty good night's pay. All right, Mr. Green. I'll take the job. Hello? 
Get the line ready, Clara. Okay, Clara, tie her up. Right. I've got her at this end. There. She's tied here, too. It's so foggy, it's hard to see if there's anybody on the dock. Oh, wait. I hear someone. Hello. Hello. I hear you. Uh, uh, are you Mr. Green? <laughs> no. My name is Dutton. Oh. Uh. I'm Paul Burnett. I'm a diver. Mr. Green called me. Uh, he hasn't gotten back from Shore City yet. He called you from there. Oh, what's the problem, Mr. Newton? Uh, Mr. Green and I came ashore about an hour ago. We landed at this dock. Uh-huh. Another man and his wife were with us. She was carrying quite a bit of jewelry in a red leather box. Uh, is that what you want me to dive for? Yes. Well, uh, you know about where it went in? Yes, I can show you. Oh, go ahead. Clara. Yes, Paul? Let's bring our equipment onto the dock and go to work. Meanwhile, in a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor meets Agent George Henderson outside the teletype room. Hi, Jim. Hello, George. Just coming down to get you. The switchboard told me you were here. What did you want? We're working together on a jewel theft that was reported about ten minutes ago. Oh? A yacht named the Laura B. radioed the local police. Said they were held up earlier tonight by two men who came aboard posing as FBI agents. Jewel theft and impersonation, eh? That's right. Seems the bandits tied up the owner, his wife, and the members of the crew. After they left, one of the crew managed to work his way loose and tied the others, and the police were contacted. How much did the bandits get? About $35,000 worth of jewelry, about $300 in cash. How'd they get aboard? In a rowboat. They got away in a tender belonging to the yacht. Have we got a description of the jewelry? We're getting it. All we know now is that the bandits carried their loot away in a red leather jewel box. Have we got any descriptions on the two men? Oh, yes. For a change, we've got complete descriptions. Oh, good. Both men are in their early 30s. They weren't corner-of-the-mouth thugs. They're well-dressed and well-spoken. I have physical details on them, too. We've already sent out an alarm on them. Uh, Jim, uh, where did this holdup take place? Oh, not too far from Shore City. I know the country around there. Uh -huh. Well, the police down there have been notified to be on the lookout for the men. You know, George, it's my guess they headed straight toward land after they left the yacht. Well, that's reasonable. Well, let's sign out of here and head for Shore City. How's your husband doing? Oh, all right, I guess. Any way of finding out? Sure. Hand me those headphones, please. What? Oh. <laughs> there you are. Thanks. You calling me, Clara? Yeah, how are you doing? I've made the first circle. No sign of the jewel box yet. You think you could have moved very far? No telling. I'll just keep looking. All right, I'll call you later. Right. Well, what did he say? Well, he hasn't seen it yet. He's not giving up. No. Joe. Huh? Oh, hello, Floyd. I see the diver got here. Uh-huh. This is his wife, Mrs. Burnett. It's Mr. Green. I do, Mr. Mrs. Burnett. He hasn't found the box yet. Joe, I want to talk to you alone for a minute. Sure. Pardon me, ma'am? Certainly. I'll call you if we find it. Thanks. We have a little trouble, Joe. What? There's no more gas in the car. Oh, fine. What do we do? Well, we're going to have to get out of here by boat. What about the diver? What do you mean? I promised him 500 for getting the box for us. Uh, well, I've got a way to pay him. It won't cost us a nickel. George, I just spoke to the chief of police. He said we could use his office. Fine. Oh, uh, your call get through to our office? Yes, Jim. No word there on the two bandits. Chief Anson is out cruising in a squad car. I spoke to him while I was in the radio room. Oh, he told me something that might tie in. Mm, what was that? A blue convertible was stolen here in Shore City earlier today. The theft was witnessed by a man named Jenkins. 
Well, how does that tie in, Jim? Well, the description this Jenkins gave of the car thief fits one of the yacht bandits perfectly. I see. Since then, a second report came in that the car was seen along the peninsula road heading back here to Shore City. I don't get that. Uh, George, I've been trying to reconstruct this thing. I'll, I'll give it to you as far as I've gotten. Huh? Okay. Now, the two bandits undoubtedly planned beforehand to use the tender from the Laura B as the means of getting ashore. That's reasonable. I hear. Yeah. Take a look at this map. Uh-huh. All right. Now, this is where the yacht was at the time of the holdup. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, if they headed straight toward the shore when they left the Laura B, they'd have landed over here at Five Coves. Right. Well, during the winter, that's a rather desolate section. There's no public transportation within miles. So they needed a car to be waiting for them when they landed. And by that... Well, as I see it, one of them probably came into town during the day, stole a car, and parked it at wherever their rendezvous point was. After the robbery, they came ashore, got the car, and headed back this way. If that's true, Jim, I... Oh, pardon me, Jim. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Mr. Taylor, this is Miss Emery at the switchboard. Yes, Miss Emery. I've just received a message from the radio room for you. Chief Hanson radioed in that that blue convertible was just reported a few minutes ago, headed back toward Five Coves. Thanks very much, Miss Emery. George, that stolen car was just seen heading back toward the coves. They must be running a shuttle. Yeah, in any case, that makes our next step automatic. There's only one road leading to those Five Coves, the Peninsula Road. Let's set up a block there and start moving in on them. husband, ma'am? Oh, no, not since I talked to him before. How long has he been down there, Joe? Well, I guess it's been about an hour now. How long can he stay under, lady? Indefinitely. What's that? Uh, my husband wants me to answer the phone. Oh. Hello, Paul. I found it, Clara. Oh, fine. I'm going to open the valve and come up. You ready? Okay, come ahead. Hey, he really shot out of the water. Just a minute, Paul. I'll have this faceplate open. There you are. Thanks. Look, cold down there. <laughs> May I have the jewel box, please? Just so we don't drop it again. Yeah. Here. Thanks. Now, hold still and I'll take your helmet off. Okay. Can we help you, ma'am? No, thanks. I'm used to this. Quite a routine. <laughs> there we are. Chest weights on? Sure. Can I take that? Thanks. Here's the other one. Okay. Now you can come on to the pier yourself. Right. Did a very fine job, Bennett. Uh, thanks. Hey, employed. Okay. Oh! <laughs> Right. Now let's all get on that boat and pull out of here. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself... I'm on the way up. Yes, we're talking to a special type of person. The man who has ambition, initiative, leadership. The kind of man who knows that a day will come when his boss will say to him... Frank, you're in. Your whole sales program was approved just as you outlined it. Here in America, increased salary always goes hand in hand with success. That is why the Equitable Life Assurance Society has created a special life insurance plan for the successful men and women of tomorrow. This plan was designed for the ambitious individual who has plenty of good, solid faith in his future, who's confident that his earning power will be far greater in 1952 or 1955 than it is today. To such a man, this equitable plan for men and women on the way up offers three important advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second, the equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection 
or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options which your Equitable Society representative will be glad to explain to you. So, why not get in touch with him immediately? Phone him as soon as possible and ask for full details on the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Three Fathom Frame-Up. The Federal Bureau of Investigation cooperates in bringing this series of official broadcasts to you for a number of reasons. Basically, it does so because it feels that they are to your best interest. Your FBI feels that these programs increase your knowledge of the habits and character of the American criminal, and that with your added knowledge, you are better equipped to help fight the currently increasing crime wave. In line with that thought, tonight's case from the files of your FBI was chosen. In this case, you meet two criminals who are unlike their fellow thieves. They are articulate. They have planned their crime well, and they are first-rate opportunists. As such, they are ready to take advantage of every circumstance. In some, they are wholly unlike the popular conception of a thief. However, they do have some things in common with other criminals. Like the rest, they are thoughtless, cruel human beings capable of inflicting every kind of mental and physical torture and capable, too, of relishing the discomfort of their victims. Their actions once more prove the criminal's credo a credo which says, if you, the innocent law-abiding citizen, stand in the way of profit or escape, you are marked for doom. Tonight's file continues on the pier at Timber Cove. Special Agent George Henderson is just coming onto the pier to meet Agent Jim Taylor. George! George, over here! Sorry it took me so long to get here, Jim. That's all right. What did you find? Well, for one thing, the stolen convertible is over there on the other side of the pier. Did you examine it? Yes, I found some fingerprints. Chief Hanson is taking them into town now to see if they match any in his local files. I wonder why they abandoned the car here. Oh, there was no gas left in it. Oh. Any trace of the tender from the Laura B? Yeah, right over there, on the beach there. Well, how did they get away from here? Oh, I think I can answer that. There's oil slick on the water on the other side of the pier. That means there was another boat here tonight. You think some Confederates picked them up? Oh, I don't believe so, George. Why not? Well, for one thing, I found this piece of glass mounted in this iron ring. Oh, what is it? It's a window from a diving room. They must have had a diver here. A diver? Yeah. My guess is that they dropped their loot and had to get a diver to retrieve it for them. Well, in that case, the diver could have been in on it. Ah, that's true. Except I think there was a fight here, too. Come here. There? Some fresh blood here on the pier. There, see? Oh, yeah. Now, a fight could have been between the diver and the bandits. That could be. Uh, I would also account for the two trips, one each way, that were made in the stolen car between here and Shore City. Huh? One of the bandits would have had to go into town to call the diver. Yes, I suppose. If, and this is a big if, George. If I'm right so far, then we've got one job to do now. Let's go to the nearest phone and try to locate that diver. Through a storm. Not too well. Yeah. 
Look, uh, how far is it to your place? Three miles. I think maybe we'll change our plans. What do you mean? Forget about Great Bay. Head for your place. You got a phone. We can call a friend from there and have him pick us up. I was just in the chief's office. He's afraid we can't search for the boat tonight. I didn't think we could. Have you spoken to our office? Yes, they've checked the description of the bandits against the files. So far, they haven't gotten any results. How about the divers? Did you contact them? I spoke to three of them so far. None of them had any calls tonight. There are four others at the Switchboard girls trying to locate them. Good. Of course, I dent might have those fingerprints I found on the stolen car on file, but that's going to take too long to find out about. By the time we hear from them, this pair will land it and... Oh, I'll get it good. Special Agent Taylor speaking. This is Miss Emery again, Mr. Taylor. None of those other numbers seem to answer. Shall I keep trying? Yes. Uh, make one more set of calls, will you? Yes, sure. Thanks very much. Any answer yet from those other divers? No. No, the girl's going to make one more try. George, if we still don't get any results, let's go out and check them in person. <laughs> Six nine one nine one. Just a moment, please. I have a call for you. Will you take it, or shall I get your number first? Uh, hold it. There's a call for you. Take it, but don't you say anything on a line. You understand? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Just a moment, please. I'm getting your party for you. Here you are. Hello, Mr. Burnett. This is Mrs. Burnett. Can I help you? Yes, ma'am. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Yes, Mr. Taylor. Tell me, did your husband receive a phone call tonight from a man who hired him to do some diving for a jewel box at Timber Cove? No, Mr. Taylor. What type of diving suit does your husband use, Mrs. Burnett? A Mark V. Uh -huh, I see. Well, thanks very much. Sorry to have bothered you at this hour. That's all right. Good night. Good night. You did that very well, lady. Now I make my call. What? Can't we wait inside the boat? I'm getting soaked. We stay here. This way we can watch for the car. But we... I'm just as wet as you are. Mr. Newton. What is it? Can I call a doctor for my husband? No. But his head... Ah, you don't call anybody till after we leave. Can we at least take him to the shack? No, ma'am. But the motion of the boat is making him worse. He stays where he is. Look, you have no right to do this. Oh, shut up! <laughs> What? 
There's a car coming down up here. Come on. We have the jewel box. Let's go. All right. Have any trouble finding it, Bill? Got the wrong party. Yeah. Stand where you are, both of you. Joe. George, put the cuffs on him. Right, Jim. I'll take that jewel box. Are you the police? The special agents, the FBI. Oh, I, I spoke to you before. I'm Mrs. Burnett. And these men... I think I know who they are and what to do with them. Paul Burnett recovered from his injury and was able to testify at the trial of Floyd Green and Joe Newton. They were both found guilty on charges of theft on the high seas and were each sentenced to 10 years in a federal penitentiary. As soon as Special Agent Taylor finished speaking on the telephone with Mrs. Burnett, he confirmed his suspicion that the small piece of glass mounted on an iron ring which he had found on the dock at Timber Cove was a window from a Mark V diving suit when he also learned that Paul Burnett was the only commercial diver in that vicinity who used the Navy-type Mark V diving helmet. He and Special Agent Henderson sped to Paul Burnett's shack. The ability to reconstruct what had happened is one of the factors which enabled Special Agents Taylor and Henderson to close the criminal careers of the two men in tonight's case and to close it within a matter of hours after receiving the first word of the crime. That ability is not inherent with Special Agents but is a part of the rigorous training each receives before he is given his credentials. Not all cases can be closed this quickly. Sometimes it takes a week or a month or even, as it did in one case, 16 long years. But whether it takes hours or years, you can be sure of one thing. Your FBI stays on the job around the clock and around the calendar until every case is closed the way tonight's was closed. With the conviction of the criminals... In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Did it ever occur to you that the kind of life insurance you buy is an index to your character? By that I mean that the person who purchases the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up gives convincing evidence of faith in himself and his future. Yes, a man is known by the life insurance he owns. So, don't think small, think big. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon and ask him to give you facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of crime in a traveling carnival. Its subject, Grand Larceny. Its title, Murder on the Midway. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder on the Midway on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.